Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on design and implementation of human computer interfaces lecture number 10 where we are going to continue with our previous case study on calendar application development. Before we begin, we will again go through the basic idea of interactive system development life cycle for easier recollection and then we will continue with the example. So, we are currently focusing on a particular stage of the overall interactive system development life cycle which comprises of many stages. What are those stages? Just to have a quick uh, recap, we have feasibility study stage, requirement gathering analysis and specification stage, design stage, prototyping stage, early evaluation of the prototype stage, coding and implementation stage, code testing stage, empirical study stage and finally, deployment and maintenance stage. So, altogether we have 9 stages which makes this interactive system development life cycle. Now, as you can see among these stages, some stages form cycles that means, they are generally performed in a loop iteratively and at many places we can find such iterations. For example, in the design prototype and evaluation stages create a cycle as shown here in this block. That means, that when we go for design, then this design has is prototyped and quickly evaluated to find out problems with the design and this process goes on iteratively till we arrive at a design that no longer has many issues. Now, when we say it does not have many issues, we essentially refer to the fact that the design is now likely to be leading to a usable product. Another important thing that we should again keep in mind is that when we are talking of the term design, we are actually referring to two types of designs. One is design of the interface and interaction that is from the user's point of view other one is design of the system that is from the systems point of view. Now, when we talk of design prototyping evaluation cycle, essentially we are referring to the design of the interfaces and interactions. In case of design of the system, we may not require prototyping and quick evaluation. However, there are other ways to evaluate system designs quickly, which is covered under code testing stage. Similarly, there is another bigger cycle that we can see from this design prototype evaluate cycle to empirical study and back. So, this bigger cycle is likely to be infrequent otherwise it will lead to huge cost and resource requirements. So, only once or twice it may happen. There is even a smaller cycle between the design and requirement gathering. So, if design is found to be having too many problems, then we may like to have further requirement gathering to refine the design. So, this smaller cycle may also be there. Among these stages, we are currently discussing the requirement gathering analysis and specification stage. So, we have already covered the basic concepts and currently we are focusing on understanding these concepts in terms of one case study, one example system development which is a calendar application. So, in the requirement gathering stage we learned what is the key requirement from the point of view of an interactive system. So, what we have learned is that 
key requirement from the point of view of an interactive system is usability, usability of the system. Now, usability requirement is applicable for interface and interaction design. It is not necessarily a requirement for system design. So, currently we are focusing on the interface and interaction design for which usability is a key requirement. Also, we have learned about how to find out functional requirements and specify it. Note here that usability requirement comes under non-functional requirement. Now, there are other ways to specify requirements. These are functional requirements which can directly translate to features of a system. So, we have seen what is usability requirements and we have also discussed how to find it out through contextual inquiry. In the case study, we have seen how to find out through contextual inquiry usability requirements for the calendar application. Separately, in another lecture, we have seen how to find out the functional requirements for the calendar application. Now, in this lecture, we are going to see how these two requirements can be combined and a common specification of requirements can be generated. In other words, here we are going to talk about how to make use of the usability requirements that we have identified through the contextual inquiry method to generate functional requirements that can be integrated in the software requirement specification document, which primarily consists of functional requirement specification. So, we will continue with the calendar application that we were covering in the earlier lectures. To recap, so we are interested to build a calendar application. Now, the application is meant for students, primarily students enrolled in colleges and universities for higher studies and the application is meant to help them in their academic activities. So, the user group as well as the use contexts are specified with these statements. Now, earlier we have seen how to find out usability requirements for the calendar app from contextual inquiry, which is one of the many methods available to identify usability requirements. So, we assumed that we performed a contextual inquiry to identify the usability requirements. Just for a quick recap, what is contextual inquiry? So, it comprises of, it is a process which comprises of five stages. It starts with a planning stage, where we plan for the overall inquiry process, preferably in the form of a script. Then initiate stage, where we start the process by communicating with the potential users from whom we will collect data as well as their higher authorities in the work setting, if any such authorities exist. In the third stage, we go for actual data collection. That means, we observe the users and take note of their behavior while they perform their tasks in the work setting. If you may recollect, contextual inquiry is primarily an observation of user behavior in a work setting in their natural work setting and occasionally this observation can be augmented with semi-structured interviews for clarification on certain observations. So, the third stage is actual observation and data collection stage. In the fourth stage, we close the observation process by sending preferably thank you notes to the participants and creating a repo, so that in future their services can again be availed if such need arises. In the fifth and final stage, we go for analysis of the observed data. There are many analysis methods and we specifically learned about one particular method, namely the affinity diagram method.
Now, in the affinity diagram method again there are 5 stages and through those stages we can analyze the data. So, what are those 5 steps or stages? First is generate idea from observation, then display the ideas on some place, it may be a wall, it may be some screen, it may be whiteboard, anywhere. Now, the ideas can be displayed in the form of sticky notes and then we need to perform a brainstorming in a team to sort those ideas into groups of similar ideas. In the fourth stage, we have to assign some group header to each group of similar ideas and finally, we need to draw the finished diagram. So, these are the 5 steps or stages through which we can analyze the data that we have collected during observations in a contextual inquiry process. Now, as we have mentioned in the earlier lecture where we discussed about contextual inquiry for the case study, we mentioned that we performed CI hypothetically with some students where we assumed that the students used paper based calendar, a computer based calendar, here by the term computer the desktops okay, computers are referred to and calendars that are available on mobile phones and they use the calendars only for academic activities. So, we ensured that the work setting remains the same and while they are using these calendars in those methods. So, you observed their behavior and noted down whatever notes we needed to take to record their behavior and to note down we use sticky notes and then we performed affinity diagram method to analyze the data where we created the affinity diagram from the observations. So, we discussed in details the diagram, the final diagram and how we arrived at that diagram, what observations we made, how we grouped them together and how we got to know the final diagram. So, we will skip those steps here and only reproduce the final affinity diagram that we obtained after performing the method. So, we managed to get few groups, one group contains two observations, one is the calendars were found to be used by all the users to set reminders and three out of five users were found to use mobile apps to check day and date and set reminder for assignment submission. So, these two observations that we have noted down were found to be related and we put them together in a group with a group heading reminder setting. Similarly, we have made another group of observations two observations were there, one is 4 out of 5 users used the calendar systems either physical or mobile or desktop based to check upcoming deadlines and again 4 out of 5 users use the calendars to check meeting dates. So, these two again are related and we put them together under a group with a group heading overall scheduling. We have also created a third group of observations having three observations. One is four out of five users were found to use the calendars to check date and then check timetable for that particular date. All were found to use the calendars to check lecture schedule on a particular day and three out of five were found to use the calendar to check meeting schedule on a particular day. 
So, in all the cases as you can see a particular day is a common link. So, accordingly we group them together these three observations and provided a group heading day wise scheduling. So, at the end of the affinity diagram method we found three groups of observations with three headings reminder setting, overall scheduling and day wise scheduling. So, this is the output of the contextual inquiry that we have performed for the calendar application development. Now, the question is what to do with this output? So, we made some observations and created an affinity diagram. Now, how we are going to use this affinity diagram that is going to be useful for development of the system. We can actually make use of these observations or rather we can actually make use of this output of the process in either of the two ways. One is either we can come up with a set of design guidelines or recommendations or principles to guide the overall design of the interface. So, this is one method, one way of using the output. The other way of using the output is to create functional requirements. So, one is to create guidelines for design, other one is to create functional requirements for system development. Now, when we say that design guidelines, we specifically refer to design of the interface rather than the system. So, given the output that we have just seen for the calendar app, what kind of guidelines we can generate? In fact, we can frame more than one guideline from the output that we got at the end of the process. Let us concentrate on the first group of observation that is overall scheduling. Here we have seen that 4 out of 5 users were found to have used the calendars to check upcoming deadlines as well as meeting dates. From these observations, we can make some guidelines. One guideline can be the app resultant app should support viewing of upcoming deadlines for assignment submission for the current day and also for next 7 days. This may be one guideline that is the app should have some support for a specific functionality which we can frame based on the observation. Similarly, based on the other observation we can frame another guideline that is the app should support viewing of scheduled meetings for the current date. So, in the group there are two observations, each observation can give us some idea about a particular guideline that is going to be helpful in coming up with a product that is likely to be usable. Let us see the other group of observations, the day wise scheduling. Under this group there are three observations. Observation 1, 4 out of 5 users were found to use the calendar to check date and timetable for that date. Second observation, all users were found to use the calendar to, to check lecture schedule on a particular day. And the third observation is 3 out of 5 users were found to have used the calendar to check meeting schedule on a particular day. So, we have made 3 observations. So, let us see how from these observations we can again frame some guidelines. One guideline which we can call guideline 3 can be the final product should support viewing of the timetable on any given day. 
again this indicates what functionality the final product should have rather than how to have that functionality. Similarly, another observation can lead us to frame another guideline that is the guideline number 4 that is the calendar app or the product should support viewing of lecture schedules on any given day. Again this comes directly from the observations that the users are likely to use these functions quite, quite frequently in their work setting which in turn is going to make the product usable. So, that is one way of making use of the output of the contextual inquiry process that is framing of guideline. As we have seen, we have framed four guidelines. These four guidelines can be used to add functionalities to the final product or the calendar app which are likely to be used frequently by the specified group of users that is the students in the specified work context that is the academic settings and that in turn is likely to lead to more efficiency, effectiveness and satisfaction of the end product as per the standard definition of usability. Now, there is as we have mentioned another way of making use of the findings that is addition of new functional requirements based on the observations. So, earlier we have seen that how to create the functional requirements that is primarily by interviewing the clients or customers and based on that we can create a functional requirement and specify it using a specific notation. The usability study also can lead us to identification of new functional requirements that we can add to the other functions in the functional requirement hierarchy. So, in this case let us see what new functions we can add. Before that let us just quickly recap what functional requirement hierarchy we have created for the calendar app. So, there were four top level functions display calendar, set reminder, set background and synchronize. Under display calendar we had display months, display days and specific date view. Under set reminders we have create reminders, edit reminders and delete reminders. Under set background we have set theme, reset theme and under synchronize we have attach account, remove account. So, these are the functions that we have identified and the hierarchy we have created along with the specification of the hierarchy. Now, based on the affinity diagram we can actually find out newer functions and add it to the existing hierarchy. Let us see how we can do that. So, based on the observations we can add a top level function views. Since it is a top level function and the fifth function in the hierarchy, so we are giving it a label R5. Now, its input is any date and output is specific view for that particular date. Now, the view may, view may be related to timetable view, submission deadlines view or meeting list view. And as we learned earlier, so for this top level function we need to add some description although it is optional, but it is always preferable to add a description. So, in this case what we can do is we can add a simple description like in this function the user can check day wise timetables of lectures or upcoming assignment submission deadlines or scheduled meeting list that is the overall purpose of this view function which is a top level function. Now, under view we can have sub functions depending on the purpose. So, one sub function can be timetable view accordingly we have given it a level 
now its input is date and output is timetable for the day. It can have a simple description like in this function the user can check day wise timetable of the lectures. Similarly, we can have another sub function deadline view. The name is deadline view, label is 5.2 because it is the second sub function under the top level function view which itself is having a level 5 because it is the fifth function in the hierarchy. Now again its input is date and output is submission deadlines. The description is quite straightforward. In this function the user can check day wise assignment submission deadlines. That is the purpose of the sub function. There can be a, a third sub function as well under the function view which is meeting schedule. Accordingly the level is 5.3, input is date, output is list of meetings scheduled on that day, list of meetings scheduled on the day and description again can be very simple. In this function the user can check day wise meeting schedule. So, what we have done? From the observations we identified that this scheduling is important and for that the user needs to get the information. To provide the information we can add certain functional requirements to the functional hierarchy. Now through these requirements we are indicating to the design team that these are to be provided as functions of the final product or as features of the final product which will be very much beneficial to the end users and will lead to improved usability of the product. So, we have seen one addition of functional requirement top level addition that is view along with its input, output and description. Under view we have added three sub functions for three activities one is viewing the deadlines, meeting schedules and lecture schedules. So, now we can add it to the hierarchy. So, we have already added these four top level functions display calendar, set reminder, set background and synchronize. Now, a fifth top level function along with its hierarchy we can add. So, this is the views this is the fifth top level function. Accordingly, we have given it a level R5 and then under it we have timetable view, deadline view and meeting schedule view. So, accordingly these are labeled as 5.1, 2, 3. So, here you can see how we made use of the outcome of the contextual inquiry process which is in the form of, a, of an affinity diagram to identify and add a new hierarchy of functional requirements in the existing hierarchy. That is the second way of using the outcome of the contextual inquiry process. The other way just to recollect is to frame design guidelines for use in a later design stage. Now, here of course, we have shown one example only. Depending on the other observations also, we can add few more functions in the form of hierarchy and further enhance the functional hierarchy that we have just seen. However, we will not detail, we will not provide any more details on those functions as well as the hierarchy and I leave it for you as a take home exercise. So, I would like to request all of you to go through the observations 
and add more functions in the hierarchy to make it complete. So, that is all for today. So, what we have learned here is we have gone through the final part of the case study to learn about how to make use of the outcome of a contextual inquiry method to enhance the software requirement specification documents by identifying and adding more functions in the functional hierarchy. Now, one thing you must keep in mind is that usability requirements are generally called non-functional requirements. So, it is not mandatory to be able to convert such requirements into functional requirements. However, in many of the cases you will find that that is possible for certain usability requirements and accordingly you should try to convert those usability requirements into functions so that in a later stage we find it easier to implement the overall system with improved usability. But I would like to re-emphasize the point that usability requirements are non-functional requirements. So, it is not mandatory to be able to convert those requirements into functional requirements. So, in a design situation if you find that you manage to find out some usability requirements, but unable to convert them to functional requirements you need not worry that is anyway part of the overall specification process. So, for non-functional requirements we specify them separately than functional requirements for which we follow a certain convention which we have discussed throughout the previous lectures. So, what matters most is at the end you get a software requirement specification document which include both non-functional requirement as well as functional requirements. So, if you are unable to convert usability requirements into functional requirements then you can keep that requirement as non-functional requirement in the SRS document and have the functional requirement specified as per the convention that we have seen. With that I would like to end this lecture. I hope you could understand the material and you will be able to translate it into practice. I also hope that you enjoyed the learning and I look forward to see you all again in the next lecture. That is all for this lecture. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.